given that we have a majority of the town council present, we will actually make this an official meeting of the town council. And uh, our, this is a ceremonial swearing in. And with us this evening is our town clerk, Shavina Martin, who is going to be joining me up here. And also our state representative, Mindy Dom, which we'd like you to come on up to. <laughs> So Shavina does the official swearing in because that is, she's certified to do that by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and by virtue of her position in the town of Amherst. So we're going to start with the school committee and I believe we have all of you present. So would you please come and just stand up here and then I'll call each of your individual names. and you will be sworn in individually. We'd also like to welcome people's families as well, some of whom are right here. <laughs> okay, Benjamin Joseph Harrington, please come forward. We, we get to experiment on it. <laughs> I, Benjamin Joseph Harrington. I, Benjamin Joseph Harrington. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. The United States of America. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the constitutions. I will support the constitutions. And duties incumbent upon me. And duties incumbent upon me. As a school committee member thereof. As a school committee member thereof. <laughs> I, Peter M. Demling, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the United States of America. To the United States of America. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I will support the Constitution. And I will support the Constitution. And the duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent upon me. As school committee member thereof. As school committee member thereof. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to have. I carry a Spitzer. I carry a Spitzer. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will be a bear true faith, true faith and allegiance. Mm -hmm. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And the duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent incumbent upon me. As school committee member. As school committee member. Thereof. Thereof. Thank you. Eric T. Nakajima. Is that okay? Congratulations. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, Eric T. Nakajima. I, Eric T. Nakajima. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And duties incumbent upon me. And duties incumbent upon me. As school committee member thereof. As school committee member thereof. Congratulations. Thank you. Blyler McDonald. I, Allison Blyler McDonald. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And the duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent upon me. As school committee member thereof. As school committee member thereof. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I, Lee R. Edwards. I, Lee R. Edwards. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And the duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent upon me. As the Library Board of Trustee thereof. As the Library Board of Trustees. <laughs> Congratulations. We're going to have you come. How are you? Good, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Are you ready? You want to raise your right hand? Sure. I, Austin D. Surratt. I, Austin D. Sarrett. Sarrett, I apologize. That's do okay. solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent upon me. As Library Board of Trustee thereof. As a Library Board of Trustee thereof. All right. Thank you very much. Yay. <laughs> 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 
I, Robert Pam. I, Robert Pam. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance. And allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent upon me. As Library Board of Trustee thereof. As the Library Board of Trustee thereof. Christopher J. Hoffman. <laughs> All right. I, Christopher J. Hoffman. I, Christopher J. Hoffman. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And duties incumbent upon me. And duties incumbent upon me. As Library Board of Trustee thereof. As the Library Board of Trustee thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> To meet you. <laughs> you ready? All right, we're gonna raise up our hand. You ready? I, Nancy E. Schroeder. I, Nancy E. Schroeder. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the United States of America. To the United States of America. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And duties incumbent upon me. And duties incumbent upon me. As a housing authority member thereof. As a housing authority member thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> I, Michael A. Burkhart. I, Michael A. Burkhart. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And the duties incumbent upon me. And the duties incumbent upon me. As a housing authority member thereof. As a housing authority member thereof. Congratulations. Thank you.
I, David W. Williams. I, David W. Williams. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. Will be a true faith and allegiance. To the United States of America. To the United States of America. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I will support the Constitution. I will support the Constitution. And duties incumbent upon me. And duties incumbent upon me. As a housing authority member thereof. As a housing authority member thereof. Congratulations. <laughs> Good evening. Seeing that we have a majority of the council president, we are calling this meeting to order on January 6, 2020. Uh, we, uh, I have a couple announcements that I want to mention. First, the Human Rights Commission is organizing an event on Wednesday, January 15th, to celebrate the birth of Reverend Martin, Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, it will be at 4 o'clock p.m. on the front steps of the town hall. Uh, also, the town council wishes to congratulate all the town employees who are recently recognized for their distinguished service of 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 years. Quite a number, and we thank you for your service. Our order of our agenda tonight, which we're going to ask you to put up, Athena, and along with the timing, is we're actually going to begin uh, very rapidly by going through the first few items and then moving on to uh, 6A, um, which is the school building discussion. And we have Superintendent of Schools, Mike Morris, with us, and uh, we will proceed with that. So first of all, uh, there are no hearings. I'm going to delay general public comment till after we do the um, 6A and 6B. And then, uh, but before we do all that, we just want to make sure that we look at and uh, consider the proclamation uh, for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day and adopt this proclamation as presented. Do I have a motion? Mandy Jo. I move to proclaim January 15th, 2020 as Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day and adopt the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Proclamation as presented. Is there a second? Second. And is there anything that particularly um, GOL would like to say at this time, George? GOL met on December 18 and uh, voted for, in favor, no opposed, and one absent to do, 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 uh, that, that this uh, proclamation uh, is deemed clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Are there any, any council comments at this time? We'd like to recognize a member of the Human Rights Commission. Just come up and say hello to us. Uh, hey, sir. Hi, my name is uh, Sid Pereira, and I'm uh, a member of the Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much for being with us. We look forward to the celebration. Any further questions? 
Then all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. It's 12-0-0. Thank you. Now we will proceed with the MSBA presentation. And we're ahead of schedule. Go. <laughs> <laughs> So welcome, I'm sitting over here because this is a team presentation with the superintendent, um, but it really is the superintendent's presentation. You'll be hearing mostly from him. And this is a similar presentation, slightly smaller than what was presented to the school committee uh, in December. So this, the idea on this is to give you a, the news about the MSA, MSBA decision and where we go from here. So I'll turn it over to Mike. And thank you for having me, and um, I will be brief. I know you have a long agenda, and today happens to be a holiday that many people uh, celebrate, and I'm one of those, or my family is one of those people. So I'll be brief for your sake and for my family's as well. Um, but I wanna start with uh, just, uh, and you've seen many of these slides, I mean, it was in the packet, so I am gonna uh, hopefully roll through these pretty quickly with the town manager and then open up for more dialogue, which may be more useful than, than going through the slides. But starting from a place of, of very good news, that we were one of uh, 11 districts, so 18% of applicants were, um, were accepted into the core program this year. We're very fortunate to be one of those 11. There are many people, there's some who actually attended the meeting who just wanted to see what it was like on the other side, and, and actually another district who had a failed project and is now trying to figure out what to do. So uh, it, was, it was a sweet moment for us, but bittersweet, knowing that there are many other uh, needy communities uh, with, with schools that are in need of repair or replacement. So uh, one thing that's a little different for those of you who tracked the last process is that uh, now they stagger eligibility periods starting for the 11 districts. And we were on the earlier side, a May 1st date of when the period starts. Uh, there are some that start further into kind of later spring and early summer, uh, so we felt good about that as well. But um, it, it's in the kind of old days, you, you, when you went and the, the board voted, you were in immediately, and now they stagger it, uh, both to, and primarily so that towns can get organized, as well as their staff can get organized. Um, the stagger helps them support districts at a higher level. So just a side note that the statement of interest for Wildwood School was not accepted. That's not atypical. Uh, both the school committee and uh, this body prioritized Fort River, and we would have only expected one project to get in. Uh, to be clear, that does not mean that the current project, uh, other that the uh, current project cannot address Wildwood's um, infrastructure challenges. And uh, I think I've just said, and I'll be a broken record on this, uh, have been for a year, uh, will continue to be that uh, my belief is that both buildings need to be addressed in the next five to seven years. And so uh, we'll talk more about Wildwood as we head into this project. Uh, before I do initial timeline, I actually want to start with a thank you, um, or kind of slow down and thank you. Um, that goes for many people in the community, but I want to thank the town council for engaging with six public sessions. There were three for staff that weren't as public, but then there were six sessions, the attendance of the town council at those listening sessions last, I think it was February, March, it was cold, uh, was, was fantastic. It made a huge difference for the community, for myself, for the school committee, to see that their colleagues at the municipal side being so present and engaged in the process. Uh, the unanimous support for the statement of interest and then the additional letter we know we've heard directly from msba made a huge difference in their consideration i don't think we'd be having this presentation if not for your support of of the work last winter and early spring so i really want to take the time to acknowledge that fact and thank you all for your continued engagement and support of the project um, so eligibility period starts May 1st. There's a handout that you may have seen that has like a lengthier breakdown. I'm not gonna go, I mean, if there's questions about it, I will, but, but I'll just, I'll talk about the initial eligibility period. So that, what that entails starting May 1st is forming a school building committee. Um, and you know that process uh, much better than myself as does the town manager. Uh, we can gather information on maintenance and capital planning. We submit that to the MSBA. We complete enrollment projections and certifications. So we have our own enrollment projections. MSBA does their own independent en enrollment and we try to come to some models that to study as part of the feasibility study. And then we have to secure lo local, local vote authorization for the feasibility study and the period can last up to 270 days. And that's, uh, the, the wording is intentional. It does not have to last 270 days. Uh, when all, if all those things are in place, 
we can um, submit that to the MSBA and hopefully move on to the next module sooner than 270 days. Um, this is uh, from MSBA's website. It's their visual of the process, uh, this part of it, the eligibility process. And this is just a screenshot of the people who are required to be on the building committee. Um, local, local municipalities have the opportunity to, be, to add members. Um, so this is really, uh, from their framing, what, who needs to be on a building committee, not a, uh, it's not an exhaustive list. I'd, I'd like to add that uh, individuals can serve more than one role, too. So you may have the MCPPO, which is the public purchasing agent certified, who is also serving as school principal or something else. So you can have multiple functions, but these are all the, all the functions that need to be represented on the school committee. And MCPPO, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a, it's about um, someone who has a certification for, procure, for, for procurement. So that, I think most of the other ones avoid acronyms, but that one se might have seemed mysterious. Um, and there are multiple members of both the school staff and town staff who have that certification. I know I'm going uh, quickly intentionally to open up more dialogue, but I thought maybe we could pause here and see if there are questions on this part so far before we get into what happens after that Steve. feasibility study and what we can do now. Yeah, so I have a question about the ones that are focused on particular careers, like architecture, engineering. Is it typical to reach out to the local professional association for, for ideas, or how, how are members solicited? How are these potential members solicited? So I think we'd use the normal process of reaching out to people and using the media, but we could also reach out to professional organizations for nominees. The process, I would think we would, um, Superintendent and I would put together a charge that we would review and meet with the school committee and the council, however the council wants to handle it. So everybody knows what the committee is going to do, what its responsibilities are, what the commitment is expected of for people who sign up. We do the reach out, outreach for um, people who want to participate. Um, we would do a interview process like I do under the charter, the town manager is the appointing authority, but we've used the residence advisory committee and the superintendent and I would participate in that interview process for anyone who submitted their names. Those names would then go to the council's OCA committee, outreach communications and appointments committee for its review and then ultimately back to the council within 30 days, you would have to act on that. So we would, I would track it just as we do with a normal appointment process. We're asking questions on this specific piece at this time. Alyssa. One of the things I asked in a, in a previous email associated with this, and I just wanted to mention to the rest of you that I'd asked for it, is that we had not concentrated in the past on voting members versus non-voting members. And so I asked that when, when Paul and, and Mike work on the charge, they sort out, well, what, you know, what makes sense because we have to do it and what really feels critical to us based on our previous experiences and then which of those are voting and which are non-voting. We perhaps have not, you know, delved, well, I know we haven't delved into those details in the past and I think that again will just help people understand what's the role of being there and what their, what part they will play in being mm -hmm. there. So thank you for mm -hmm. being willing to consider that. Yes, Mike. Just a, 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 a slight um, addition to Ms. Brewer's comments is I think one of the things that we're looking for at the school side is how do we engage staff, and I think the same would be on the community side, who aren't members of the committee. In other words, being a member of the committee isn't the only way to offer input and affect the decisions that are made. And so I know uh, on the school side, I'm thinking a lot about staff and teachers uh, explicitly who may not have the time commitment uh, capabilities to participate in something like a school building committee, and yet we really want to actively solicit and gather their feedback and what are the, the kind of forums and formats by which communication extends beyond the people who are selected who volunteer and are selected for this committee, because I think it's incredibly important who's on a building committee. It's also incredibly important that those aren't the only voices that are heard. Um, so I want to just kind of acknowledge Ms. Brewer's point and extend it uh, a bit further as well. Okay. Are there other questions about this, Darcy? Um, I guess I would ask, um, lines, um, what are your plans to make sure that different voices are actually included in the membership of the building committee? 
So uh, uh, that's part of our, uh, I would depend on our CPOs who would do additional outreach and through all of you, you all have connections into the community. We want the community to be representative of our, of our school committee especially, community especially. So I think um, while we're trying to hit all those boxes, we're also gonna make sure that it's uh, broadly representative of the town of Amherst. Meaning not just diversity um, of age, race, sex, and so on, but diversity of voices, different opinions about our plans. Yes? Yes, I mean, we will take into account anybody who interviews and we'll talk to them about what their interests are. Steve. Um, so is it possible that one of these folks can be a town counselor? Or, uh, I guess could be a... Well, my, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this. My feeling is if there's a school committee member, it would make sense if there's a town counselor who's interested in serving, they have a town counselor serve on it as well. It's a, I want to note that it's a pretty hefty commitment of time. It's gonna be multiple years, it's gonna be very regular meetings. And so when someone says I'm willing to do it, we wanna make sure before we even advertise uh, what the commitment of time that's gonna be expected. So. Um, people say, if they raise their hand and say, I'm interested, they know what they're getting into. Okay. Alyssa. I just want to follow up on that diversity of opinion concept, and I, and I don't want to belabor this because I know we have a lot to talk about tonight just on this topic alone, but perhaps for a future conversation is that it appears self-evident to a large number of people that we are not going to be able to repair both individual school buildings. I do not want to place someone on the school on the school building committee who is dedicated to repairing and renovating two separate school buildings. I don't see the point of that. And so when we're talking about diversity of opinion, I think we need to be clear on within what parameters. Just as when we hired the town manager the last time, we said this was what we were looking for as a community in a town manager. You don't get to get appointed to the screening committee and bring a different idea of what you think a town manager should be. You're someone who's moving forward on this. So while at the one hand there's open-mindedness, on the other hand, if it's absolutely the only thing that will be done is we are keeping both those buildings where they are right now, I don't think that person has a place on the committee because that's not where we're headed with this. And so I think we need to figure out how to talk mm -hmm. about that at some point. Okay, Dorothy. Yes, that was really my question. I think we voted, uh, or maybe the school board voted, I'm not even sure who voted, but I kind of thought I voted, for a one large school, 600 students, K through five or K through six, that to be determined, and that we weren't gonna re-litigate that issue. Is that correct? So one thing with that has to be studied is a code upgrade of the current building. Uh, I think we have a lot of great information about that from the Fort River feasibility study, um, but really that decision gets made through the enrollment projection process. And um, it's a tricky, I'll just say my perspective on it. I think it's a tricky matter because we, when we were doing those listening sessions, you know, I proposed an idea to the school committee which they endorsed bringing to those listening sessions. Uh, at no point did we ask people to commit to only looking at that option. They, we, we asked them to commit to putting that in a statement of interest, that it would be studied, that it was certainly a preferred option. I think I've been really clear about that. I think the school committee, frankly, has been very clear about that. And I think to your point, I think the town council has been clear about that. But uh, we never said this is the only thing we're going to look at. Um, and I think if, if we said that, uh, it would definitely streamline things. But I do think people would feel like that wasn't the question they were asked at those listening sessions. They were asked their reaction to it, not uh, a full commitment to that being the only option. In the interest of not getting stuck on this issue, because we will be looking at a charge for the committee in which these kinds of issues will be hammered out, and uh, let's use that opportunity at a future date. Are there other questions on this specifically? Then why don't we move on? Sure. So from the MSBA, um, direct quote at the meeting where um, it was actually a meeting after the MSBA vote um, when we were in uh, with other, other districts that were in the same position. Uh, they reminded us multiple, numerous times that projects take five to seven years and everyone wants to think that they can do it faster. Mm -hmm. And what they find is that when districts try to do it faster, bad things happen. Um, 
And so because of that, they built in a safeguard, which this went to everyone who received the, the good news invitation letter, that the town's vote by the board of directors approving a potential grant will be no sooner than July 1st, 2022. And let me talk about what that means. What that means is basically what happens is there's multiple approvals that are needed along the way. And the MSBA will not vote what's called a project scope and budget, which is where they commit to their end of the funding. You know, pretty long end of schematic design. They won't commit to their end of the funding sooner than July 1st, 2022. And that means, and they meet every other month, so it's not like they have meetings as regularly as this body. So what that means is the soonest the town could take a potential vote would be the fall of 2022. Uh, because of the nature of the process after uh, both the MSBA vote and the town vote, that means the soonest a new building could open under the best of conditions, the quickest construction method if that was selected, would be the fall of 2025. Um, most school years are, are funny that way. People don't change their buildings in April, right? Even if you were ready to go, you can't move all the things you need to move and, and make a move with a, two months in the year left. So, so really that's what we're looking at uh, and that's what they emphasize with five to seven years. I think it's worth noting that uh, I think, well, I feel urgency, there's no surprise there about the buildings. I think the MSP is wise to do this. Um, we have a lot of information about our buildings. There's still a lot of work to do. Uh, for this community, for a building committee, and for the MSBA to feel like we're moving at a pace where their approvals are happening uh, regularly, where they're offering systematic feedback and iterative feedback along the way. And so they built in that safeguard <coughs> to protect themselves, but really it was more to protect towns and communities from trying to rush through a process that's intentionally um, should not be rushed. And, and they talked about the past before MSBA existed and what was, there was a, it was called SBA, and it was a, there was a similar organization and all the problems they ran into because they weren't as deliberate as they are right now. So sorry to overemphasize that point, but it is one of the, a sobering point on timeline. And yet I think it's a really important point for the council as well as the community to understand clearly. Okay. And so uh, this is also directly from MSBA districts or you know, the things that districts are uh, primarily in charge of in blue and construction professionals in green. So we're at the very beginning, we're actually it cut off. We couldn't figure out a way to graphically show this. We're not yet in eligibility. That starts May 1st, but we're, we're gonna pretend that we are. Uh, for informing the project team, that's, not, that's really when you're hiring your consultants. So that goes through a formal bid process for the designer that goes actually MSBA gets more votes than, than the locality that goes to a meeting at MSBA, uh, then you get into a feasibility study. Uh, when that's approved, you get to schematic design, and then the funding the project. So that's where both the MSBA takes their vote, again, no earlier than, than um, summer 2022, and it goes back to then the town or uh, municipality to do that. Detailed design happened after that. Where you get to schematic design, that's not building construction documents. Um, it's not at that level. Uh, so detailed design takes um, six to eight months uh, on average, could take a bit longer. And then you have a construction period in this project, you would guess two to three years. Um, new construction a little quicker, add reno a little slower. Uh, and then completing the project is that there's all this commissioning done afterwards, basically to make sure that the building's operating as it should operate. Um, so that process, at, you know, if you include the completing, really takes six years, um, but the kids are in uh, and the staff are in after the fifth year. So when we say five to seven years, uh, we're mostly thinking about those nice images we all have of a ribbon, ribbon cutting and excited faces, um, but it, it actually extends a little bit beyond that. So here's probably the most useful slide in the, in the entire deck, uh, which is what the school committee can do. We've actually created a project website, um, so that's already been done. And the last slide on this, you'll see that there's a link to that. Uh, we have my last meeting tomorrow. I've, got, I've gone to all the elementary schools to just fill them in on where we are and what this all means. Um, we'll be continuing to have this topic on school committee agendas, uh, publish articles in media. That actually has happened uh, most recently in the Amherst Bulletin and the Gazette. And uh, next week, I think, we're, Mr. Bachman and I are gonna be on a Window into ARPS episode for Amherst Media just talking about you know, these, same very topic, uh, these same topics. And we're developing models, as I mentioned earlier, of engaging, ensuring that staff are continue to be engaged even if they're not able to commit the time to be on the building committee. And uh, when we go to town manager, town council, I think we've already talked about that first bulleted point about the building committee. Uh, the second one has come to me. I've gotten a lot of feedback from members of the public on this second bulleted point, which is that on uh, November 18th, the town council took a vote, and one of the goals are, uh, was to be carbon neutral no later than 2050. 
And so I've gotten the question, uh, does that mean that this building needs to be net zero, whether it's new construction or ad reno, ad reno construction? And I say, it's a great question for town council. There's an email you can send them. And, uh, but in all seriousness, I, my belief is, uh, my goal number one, goal number two, goal number three is to have students and staff in, in wonderful, healthy buildings as soon as possible. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts about um, climate change and sustainability. I'm not an expert in them, and you're not going to hear them, because that's not how I see my role in this. But I do think this could be a barrier. And the more, I guess my request to the town council is if, if you all can figure out, is this, how, do, how would this manifest? How does this vote that the town council took manifest in a building project? On the front end, it would save us tremendous time, energy, and angst as we go through the process. Because I, what I've heard already is there's different interpretations of what that vote means. Uh, and I've been very clear with people, I'm not the best, best person to be able to interpret that vote, and I'm not asking you to do that right now. Uh, but it is something that before we get architects and designers and OPMs on board, having clarity on that particular topic, uh, and again, I'm not weighing in on that, but having clarity, whatever it is, will really um, expedite our work and I think um, avoid some um, dialogue that, that has a chance of slowing us down quite a bit. Okay. And then the last one on this one is funding the feasibility study. Uh, the MSBA uh, shared with us um, that they, were not, they will not be participating in the funding of the feasibility study because based on their failed vote process that they, they fund feasibility studies once um, and that has already occurred. And so uh, the vote language that you'll get from MSBA will, will probably be clear and that'll be sort of the in writing part of what they're willing to do which is support us from a, a resource uh, feedback guidance perspective but not from a financial perspective until we got to project scope and budget in the actual construction. I probably took more of that slide than Mr. Bachman was planning, so I apologize, Paul. It's good. We're good. Um, and uh, again, I'll try to uh, go through the cost of the feasibility studies. Uh, this was from data the MSBA gave us that day. This is the last two years, every single elementary MSBA project feasibility study that they had um, in their database. So you can see there's a significant range in feasibility study costs. I do believe because we did, we, we have a feasibility study for Fort Wildwood and we have one for Fort River, that our costs should be um, on the lowest end of this chart and perhaps even lower. Uh, our previous study, granted there's been escalation since that point, uh, what was asked for at town meeting in I think it was spring of 2014 was a million dollars. We did not spend all that million dollars. Uh, we were very conservative with, with our work, so I would presume that this project should be lower. Uh, it's likely to be higher than $400,000 that has been already you know, discussed by the council, um, but uh, there will have to be a formal vote with language from the MSBA on that, and that they'll, when, we're, when this body's ready for that vote, uh, they'll send us a language that can be reviewed. So I just want to summarize a couple things yeah. I've heard, and one is that we will have to do the appropriation for the feasibility study. Uh, we will have to have a discussion about the relationship of the building to the issue of our climate action goals, and uh, to some extent how that fits in with the zero energy bylaw for first town buildings. And the other one is the charge for the committee and the makeup of the committee. Are there other things that I missed? And just in general paying attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there questions from the council? Kathy. Okay, I have one on this slide and I actually sent it in in advance sure. on the, you've already raised it that we have done a considerable amount of work. Yeah. Um, what I was wondering is can it both save us money on the feasibility study but to the extent MSBA wants you to go through certain steps, well, they say, actually, you've done those steps, you know, between while, you know, so are we, if it would have been a million dollars, but we've spent 400,000 already on steps they care about. So do, do we know in writing that we think we've got it done, but would they think we've got it done? Sure, so actually, it goes back to this slide. So what you see on this slide is that um, the construction professionals are running uh, with the, you know, working for the building committee, the feasibility study and the schematic design. And the feedback, we asked that question directly to MSBA is it really depends on whether the, how the consultants view the work that's happened uh, and what they can integrate from it. Um, so uh, their point wasn't we won't accept it, we will accept it. It's that they accept submissions from, from designers that are voted by school building committees. 
And at that point, they'll make the determination. The bar's the same. It's not like we have a higher bar because of that or a lower bar. Uh, they thought, my personal opinion is likely we'll be able to save time and, and money because of the work that happened. But uh, since we're not designers, uh, we're not in a position to answer that question. But that's who would take all the existing data, um, the Wildwood study, the Fort River study, anything that comes out of the Crocker Farm study, and be able to integrate that into their work. I just do a follow up on that. Do you, do you have a sense of timing on whether and I'm thinking we've budgeted $400,000, so are you going to need to add, ask for more? Right. And when we're about to go into the budget cycle and we'll have to decide by June 30th, but you know, uh, w when will you have a good guess of how much more than that you will need? I would guess that we would want to put a number in during this capital planning pro cycle, and I think if what Superintendent is saying we'll probably have the 400,000 that's already been set aside and they add another 350 to it, put in 750. Okay. Pat. Um, I'm curious uh, why you're thinking about not including choice students in the certified uh, enrollment. Um, can you give me some information about that? So it's not that I wouldn't be including choice students, it's that when the MSBA, um, on at least the last project we had, they look at resident students. So uh, most MSBA projects, and this is no exception at the elementary level, don't benefit the students who are currently in the school. So they're projecting forward, they're looking at census data from the town of Amherst, they're looking at live births from the town of Amherst. They're not looking at, well, there are live births from the town of South Hadley, and generally a couple school choice students are accepted from South Hadley. They're looking at resident students, and that's kind of the MSBA, at least in the past, has, has a perspective that the town of Amherst should be building a school for students who reside in the town of Amherst. And I get that. So choice is, is not a typical, I mean, choice is a thing on Cape Cod and Western Massachusetts. If you go to Eastern Mass, there are very few districts that accept choice. Um, so from, I think, my belief, or my understanding from their perspective is we're funding a project for the children of Amherst not the children who reside in other towns who are accepted by a choice. Mandy Drew. I just wanted to follow up on that. Yeah. What about, what I, I've heard about the choice issue, but I've never heard how the charter students and how that affects the enrollment projections in terms of what the MSBA might certify. So uh, I think I'll be able to answer better in five months when they start that process with me. I'm going off my experience, which was in 2013, 2014, on the enrollment piece. Um, so I think in general, they're looking at the yield. So you look at live births, and then how many yield in, end up in the elementary schools. So I know we do that with our enrollment projections. I know MSBA does that. So if there's 145 live births, what on, how many of those children on average enter the Amherst Public Schools five years later? And so they use some metric around that. So I think it's not about individual looking at this grade level, how many kids are at charter school, but it does affect the kind of the correlation between live births and enrollment. Does that help enough? Yeah. Or? Okay. Pat, did you have another question? Oh, Andy, I'm sorry. So we know that um, our current elementary schools have significant problems that are going to need to be addressed over the next years before a new building can be built. Um, and I can't, and I would assume that other districts have been in the similar situation. Is there any consideration given by MSBA to work with the community to expedite the process in order to um, enable the community to deal with those um, realities and not have to invest multiple dollars and could be into the millions to um, keep buildings going that we don't intend to keep going. I'm not aware of um, any system uh, that describes things as you, as you stated, um, but it's not really something we can inquire as we get into the process. Pat. I'm um, curious about where we stand as um, in terms of the sixth grade moving to the middle school. If no, no, finish your. I'm <laughs> I was just going to say if the sixth grade does move to the middle school, 
Consideration. Sure. So uh, I think you can describe your questions with a, a process answer more than a, a, a tangible answer. So we have a group that actually the last meeting is, is coming next Monday that's looking at, we call it the Great Span Advisory Board, and they've been looking at that sixth grade question, and that's a four town conversation. So that's not solely an Amherst conversation. Yeah. And uh, the idea for that group is they'll, uh, they were explicitly in their charge, speaking of charges that we did earlier, they were not, um, they were not tasked with making a recommendation. They were tasked with studying, coming up with a model that the communities could respond to. And I think there, there's great work being done. I think we'll be able to do that in probably in February with a report to the school committee. Uh, and then engaging members, the member towns, about what they think. Uh, the, the plan after that would really be in the summer to take both the work of this grade span advisory group as well as the feedback we received this spring and, and have staff members work on a concrete proposal. Because uh, we're not there yet, and intentionally not there. We're, it's not intended to be a quick decision-making process um, to re-engage folks in the fall about um, so that they can respond at first to these more general ideas or concepts, uh, get really tangible, finite, and then have people respond to uh, a more clear proposal in the, in the fall. Um, but we would not anticipate that change happening um, separate from decision for, we really need two summers for that change to happen because if you know that educators are really busy during the school year and it's not the best time to be planning that and having lived through closing a Mark's Meadow and redistricting when I was a principal at Crocker Farm, that, that two summers was invaluable. We couldn't have done it with one summer in between. I think the second part of your question, maybe I, I've forgotten, I'm sorry. Balance Crocker Farm student population and Fort River student population, oh, or are they going to remain different? Because they're going to be 600 at Fort River, 300. That'll play out in the enrollment. I'll, I'll give you my initial just piece of information. It's not going to be a clear answer. Is I think when we, we talked about 600 students, we also talked about um, a third of those students, or roughly 200, being part of a dual language program, which, which is really functionally a school within a school in terms of who students interact with from a placement perspective. Um, so what would be a larger school building, I, I think there's lots of ways that it would feel um, not wildly different than Crocker Farm in terms of the number of sections per grade level that you interact with. Is that? Yeah, okay. Kathy. Okay, I'm gonna go back to money. Um, and it's, it's probably one that you'll say you, you don't know the answer right now, but if um, when we were in the listening sessions, one possibility, and it's building on Pat's, was if six moved up, you still might, or if it didn't move up, you might be thinking of an expansion on Crocker to absorb the total. And I know there's a Crocker form study undergoing. So my question is on the MSB end. If, right. if at the rear end we come out with a, we want this one new school and we want to, and then add a classroom to clock Crocker, whatever that might be, or we're moving six up to middle school, but that involves some spending. Could we make that part of the total budget of the project that MSBA would, so we're not doing two schools, but we're doing one project that has two parts. Do you, could they fund it if we packaged it that way? I'll give a slight narrative, then I'll give you an answer. So you know, there's this, because uh, I want to explain some of my kind of um, my responses. So there's the, you know, people know the fox and the hedgehog, Right so, you know, the, right, so the hedgehog answer is really clearly, um, very confidently, and uh, so I do that on one thing in this project, which is we're in, we start May 1st, and all schools, schools need to be taken care of in the next five to seven years, right? So that's my hedgehog answer. When I'm doing predictions, I'm gonna be very fox-like, which is that I'm gonna say it's unlikely, based on my experience and my professional judgment, that MSBA would fund a side project for Crocker Farm. Can I say absolutely they wouldn't? I can't. Do I have evidence, uh, good evidence, that would suggest that they would? I don't have that, um, so that's my personal opinion, but I, I, I can't answer definitively for them. I'd like to go ahead and, unless the council has more questions, we did put aside, this is public comment. We have one more slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so this actually got to Mr. Steinberg's question, uh, which is that 
there are going to be capital needs that need to be addressed. And we're trying to be very thoughtful, and we, we will be very thoughtful. I met um, with our facilities director right before the, actually during the break on this topic. We're going to be very thoughtful about how we approach Fort River Wildwood. There are some things that will need to be addressed in the next five to seven years. We're also trying to be, if, if, if there is, whether it's renovation or new construction, we're trying to think about what are the things, there's going to be a child that's in first grade right now that's going to spend the rest of their career at Fort River and Wildwood no matter what happens with this project. What's the most important things for that child? Our staff are going to be at this school for these schools for five to seven years no matter what happens. What are the things we need to do? Um, and uh, what's the calculus of what do we need to do versus if the building was lasting 20 more years, yeah, absolutely we'd do this, but can we hold off on those things? So for us, it's about health, safety, and accessibility. And that's going to be the focus for the capital projects for Wildwood and Fort River in the next five years, five to seven years. I think some of the other things that we would absolutely be asking for, and, you know, if the buildings we're going to be on, we're going to hold off on those because really it's, it's those three are our guiding force, or guiding um, kind of compasses on that project. And just and ARPS, you know, our building website, building project website's up, and the MSBA, if you want to get dig way into minutia, is right there. Okay. Um, so wait till you leave. Wait, you might want to just sit to the side. Sure, there may be I will do that. Question. Thank you very much. Are there any people with public comment on this particular issue? Okay, are there any further questions from the council? Recognizing that this is one of, I'm sorry, please. Even though, even though my, my name is Kate Trost, I live on Dana Street, and I wanted to make the statement that uh, even though my children are, have already gone through the schools, I, full-heartedly support um, investments in the schools in the short-term, middle-term, and long-term, and really encourage the town to, to, to get better at developing a spirit in this town where people don't just have to have kids in the schools to want to fund them. And um, that, in the school district that I had come from before in upstate New York, I mean, we got a newsletter, everybody in the town did, with stats and new teachers and accomplishments. And there was this feeling in that town of uh, the number one thing is funding the schools. So I, I believe in that. I think it's the, it's the best um, equalizer. Thank okay. you. Any further comment at this time on this issue? Okay, um, final comments from the council, but, but I do want to move on. Okay, Dorothy? I sub, uh, really support what she said. I think websites are great, but I lived here for many years without ever looking up anything on any Amherst Town website. I only did that after I was elected. So I do think mail, direct mail, uh, hand-delivered mail or whatever to people that informs them of what's going on in the schools is a great idea. Okay. All right, Mike, thank you very much. We'd also recognize Mr. Slaughter, or Dr. Slaughter, who has joined us as the new finance director for the schools, and our school committee members who are back here. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to the discussion about the timeline for 132 Northampton Road. Uh, would you, Laura, and please come forward. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager at Valley Community Development Corporation. Uh, we really appreciate your time tonight. We wanted to come before you to give a brief update as to process and timing for the next step of the project, which is the project eligibility letter application to a state financing agency. Um, we also wanted to acknowledge and appreciate the amount of time that this council put in over the past summer 
considering this project and uh, supporting financially supporting the project. Uh, Valley, uh, we continue to be strongly committed to accomplishing the proposed development. Um, and as I said, we're here to give just a brief update tonight. Uh, we are running behind our original timeline to submit this application uh, for several reasons. Um, our original project architect was Kathy Ford. Um, let us know she'll be retiring in another year or two. Because these projects tend to run for three to five years, we wanted to have continuity. And she and we agreed that it was better to change horses now rather than later. So we hired a new firm, which is called Austin Design. Um, and it took them a little bit of time to get up to speed. And then they looked at the design with fresh eyes, as architects are wont to do, and that took a little time. And we believe the product in the end will be better for this process, but it, it was a delay that we had not foreseen. Um, we also, after listening to the feedback last summer, um, spent a considerable amount of time working on a supportive services plan for the property. Um, this type of plan is not required by the state until you get into funding. So it is not typically part of the uh, project eligibility letter application. However, we wanted to submit it with the application because we heard, uh, especially from neighbors, that this was a high priority concern of theirs. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking to our peers, um, pretty much statewide, people running similar types of, of housing. Um, we did accomplish repairs to the existing house at 132 Northampton Road, both because it needed it, and also to get a rental permit um, from the town for that property. Um, we do plan to have short-term tenants beginning uh, this coming June for one year uh, in order to def defray the carrying costs of owning the property. Uh, we continue to meet with the Butters and community members through the summer and well into the fall and the winter. Um, and in fact, we have another meeting scheduled later this week with one of our neighbors. Um, and some of the requests and suggestions coming forward from abutters are ones that took some time and are taking some time to explore whether they can be accommodated or not. Um, and then just as a general point of information, to date we've received four requests um, to delay submission of the project eligibility letter application, either from um, council members or from town staff. Um, the first request came to not submit during the summer break because people might be away. Um, then we were asked not to submit in November due to upcoming kind of exams and end of term busyness. Uh, we were then asked not to submit in December um, due to the upcoming holidays and, and the break. Um, and most recently, we were asked not to submit until the end of January due to the academic break. And it's not to say that that's driving our timeline, but just as a point of information for the council to understand that we've gotten a number of requests about kind of the timing of the application. Um, at this time, we believe uh, the stars will align for all parties uh, for a submission later this month uh, because we feel ready. Uh, the holidays are over. The academic break is coming to an end later this month. Um, for your information, there's typically a, a little bit of a delay between when a developer submits one of these applications and when the state writes to the town and starts a 30-day comment period. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Um, and just to let you know and everyone know that we do plan to include all of the letters as they're compiled on the town website um, with this application, as well as press coverage to date. And so the state, when they look at this, will be able to know about the community concerns that have been raised. They will know about local support from people. Um, people who have concerns don't have to write new letters necessarily, although they're welcome to. Um, but we'll be trying to give the state a very comprehensive look at really how much time and effort and energy went into um, critiquing, supporting, sh trying to shape and mold this particular development process. And again, really appreciate your time. Okay. Are there questions from the council at this point? Again, our purpose tonight is to just receive an update on the um, 
submission of the application to the state and understand what's happening with that. Just a quick Dorothy? Are you willing to share any of your conclusions about your service and supportive uh, services? Um, I think because we're going to be putting out all of this information within a few weeks, our preference is to just wait and let everybody have at it at the same time. Um, it's a pretty long document that we put together related to supportive services, so I think it'll be interesting. But to clarify, that supportive services will be part of your application and therefore will be part of the 30-day public comment period. Yes, people can comment on anything, anything related to the project during that comment period. Okay. Um, it, it will, by definition, everything that goes in at this stage is in draft format. Um, the services plan is final, finalized by approval of the state at the point when they fund the project. So it's a, it's a work in progress um, mm -hmm. for quite a while yet. And, and I, I think just to clarify, Joanne Campbell Valley, CDC, is that the the 30 day sort of when we submit the project eligibility letter to the state and to the town this the state will tell you when that 30 day period starts so you actually have more than 30 days you could have another two or three weeks beyond that right right it doesn't start the moment it gets submitted to the state right. or the town and again they'll get everything that's been submitted so far so it's not like they won't know the level of concerns and the type of concerns that have been raised. Um, the town has committed to post it on their website. I have personally committed to distribute it to people who requested it from us. So uh, it will be really broadly available to everyone. Okay. Are there other questions? Alyssa? I just had two things. One is when it comes to the delays, and I appreciate you characterizing that, it's obviously always difficult in an academic community, but just for our benefit as a town council, I don't think any town councilors should have been telling them anything about delaying. Mm -hmm. No one was speaking for this town council when they did that, and so um, we might want to revisit that <laughs> at some point. Thank you. Um, and the other, it's kind of left September, October, but that's bad too. But the <laughs> other part, aspect that I wanted, and then just part, because it feeds into our role moving forward, if we could clarify, which is not your job to clarify, but if we could clarify before we leave here tonight what our next step is. I mean, it's, it's great that we are getting more public attention to what they are doing, but what is the actual town council role in the 30-day period and afterward because it's my belief that it's extremely limited. So I would just like that to be clear to people so that when they are commenting, they are commenting to through the public comment process, but not to the council if the council can't actually do anything about it. Right. I think that's an important clarification that at this point, the application goes to the state. Uh, the comments come into both the state and the town. Uh, and that in fact this does not come down come back to the town council as an item of business not to say we're not watching it's just that it's then goes on to planning the cba right so the, really the 30-day comment period is a courtesy from the state essentially to the government that's who it's intended for so the okay. municipality could in some cases is learning about a project for the first time when this application goes in. And so the state doesn't want the town itself to be taken unawares. And if there are strong feelings, they want to know about them at that point in time. Um, the town of Amherst has expressed its view in a number of ways already and could, could express its view again. But the, the level of commitment of financial support is going to telegraph very clearly um, to the state government. Um, and I would also just add the counselors who um, asked us not to submit, I think we're making um, helpful suggestions. They were not making demands. They were really wanting to protect the process and the right of people to participate in the process. And so felt like um, if we submit at certain times when people might be out of town, they might feel like they had missed out on that window to comment. And so just wanted us to be strategic about that timing. So, are there other questions from the council? 
This is an item for public comment. Who would like to make public comment at this time? Please come forward. Um, my name is Kate Trost. I live at 99 Dana Street. Um, Valley CDC is planning to submit their Pell application with schematic architectural plans and plans for their supportive services later this month. It's been more than six months since there has been an update um, of information regarding this project to the council. Um, in a situation like this, where a project gets a major exemption from the pre-existing zoning, of course the abutting neighbors or the neighborhood will have concerns and of course there will be specific site issues that warrant particular attention. Uh, the zoning was created with not this particular site in mind. It could have gone somewhere in North Amherst, it could have gone somewhere in East Amherst. And in those locations, the size would be different, the neighbors would be different, the streets would be different. Um, in my opinion, as a, a person with more than 20 years of landscape architecture and planning experience, um, I have been dismayed by the lack of specific site um, analysis and um, acknowledgement. Um, in my opinion, the council here, I understood the vote for, with the CPA funding, but I, given the, the unusual zoning situation and, and the potential effect it will have on the surrounding many things, the traffic on Route 9, the Amherst, I think they've met with Amherst College. I've been investigating through little snippets of information. Um, the sidewalk improvements, you know, the setbacks, all that stuff. But I think the council and the town are really the ones that are going to hold responsibility for how this turns out. I understand that we're supposed to go to the zoning committee, have comments and so forth, but I don't really think that those comments from the neighbors are going to be uh, held with, well, we'll see. But I feel as though it is part of your responsibility to follow a project like this. At least check in with the town planners. Is anything happening with this? Can you check, can you do updates with the developer and see where they are? Because there are, I believe, gonna be a lot of changes in the site plan from what you saw before. I think they're maybe tearing down that old building that was there. That wasn't what you saw before. I think they may be flipping the parking to the other side. I think they may be asking for a new driveway location and curb cut. A bunch of things. As, we, as we've asked, we can't find out what the supportive services are even though there was a lot of comment about that, and it would, in best of all possible worlds, have been nice to have received some response. Response to, these are our concerns, we're going to try to do this, that, and the other thing. I mean, it depends on how you, you like to see things done, but I am an idealist, and I really do think that the best project, really well done, would bring the neighborhood in along the way. And that if, if not by bringing everyone in the neighborhood there, at least as our representatives, you follow up with some of the concerns with the developer. And, oh, and parking. I have, I know I had site issues right from the beginning because that's my background, but I am, I mean, I'm not gonna get over the, if this project doesn't have enough parking, there's got to be a plan where the extra cars park and not just, well, they won't have cars or no one will be visiting them or any of that stuff. Because this is like for all these developments in town, once they happen, they don't go away. And we can't be, we've got to hold the developers accountable to things that 
residents, taxpaying residents, care about and make the developments work for everybody. I'm, I, I accept the project, I just want it to be fine in every way, a success, and not cause future problems with traffic on Route 9, parking overflow, blah, blah. Okay, so those are my comments. Thank you. Yes, are there any other comments? Okay, I do want to remind you that we have a three minute limit. Please come forward. <clears throat> you can certainly ask us questions. It's not clear we're going to be able to forward them at this time. Uh, my name is Hillary Wilbur Farrow. I grew up at the abutting property on 126 Northampton Road. It is my backyard. I've emailed all of you about um, my, I agree with affordable housing, but I do not agree with the size of this project. Um, my question, my first question is, um, I believe that the zoning board has to vote on changing the zoning for this property, and I'm wondering where that takes place in regard to once the plan is submitted to the state. Question one, is that something that Just can be answered? Just continue with your questions, and it can't be answered. we'll make okay. sure they're recorded. Um, my other question is, um, other than the supportive services plan, what other um, considerations might have been taken in after hearing neighbors' concerns? Okay. And those are my two questions. Thank you. Are there other public comments at this time? Please come forward and state your name. It's not clear that we can answer those questions, whether or not we have the right people in the room. The real purpose of tonight's meeting was to talk about the timeline. And so we did not prepare this as a response to various other questions. Thanks. Um, I'm a neighbor on Dana Street, and I would prefer not to give my name. Uh, so I have three questions um, and points I'd like to make. First of all, uh, I really appreciate the town's attention to affordable housing, and I think we're united in our understanding of the need for affordable housing and housing in general in Amherst. And I would ask the town council to urge Valley CDC to ensure that the house can be occupied as soon as possible. They mentioned that some repairs have been done, but the house is still sitting empty. Um, and that was something we asked about this summer and we're told they were going to be getting on that as soon as possible. And I think that renting the house would really help to build trust with neighbors that Valley is in fact a responsible and responsive landlord. Um, and that would also help to lower the public costs of the project. So hopefully it can be occupied quickly. Um, my second question is uh, related to that. This is public funding that's being used and I don't quite understand with regards to the timeline, how the town council will vet and vote on the new plans that are being put forward by Valley CDC. Uh, it sounds like there's a whole new architectural design, there might be a new number of units, and uh, yet the plan that was voted on was something else that went through. Uh, so it seems appropriate that the town council would vet and vote on a new plan um, as a, because this is public funding by the town. It also seems appropriate that information would be shared with the public about those plans as the town council is vetting uh, those new plans. It, it just seems to me that it would make sense that it goes back through the CRC process that it went through before. And so my question is about that timeline. Uh, my third question is just whether neighbors could participate in the site visit by the state. Um, this is something we had raised with the town planner's office and we didn't receive a conclusive answer on that. Um, the purpose of that would just be for neighbors to be able to share their perspective and make sure that the information about the neighborhood was being communicated accurately. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? We have recorded your questions, and to the extent that we can provide answers, we will. Uh, some of those answers are perhaps not what you want to hear. Um, because, frankly, this is not something that will come back to the council for approval of the design. That's not how this process works for this or any other public construction project or other construction projects in town. Um, if there are bylaws or issues that have to be addressed because the council is the keeper of those, public way issues, then it does come back to the council. But this is the reason why we spend the optimal time that we do, both in investing in our expert staff 
as well as investing in the appointments to the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals. And we're in the process now of appointing additional people to those. Those are direct appointments of the council, and we have to place by state statute some serious trust in those bodies. Um, are there any other comments from the council at this time? Evan. Yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, thank the two people from Valley CDC for for coming tonight. Um, I think that uh, there have been a lot of questions about what's going on with the project. Um, and certainly I think a lot of us were expecting things to happen a lot faster. And so having heard those explanations, I think were, were very useful. So I appreciate you coming out and spending your time and hearing um, the work that y'all did because this is no longer a matter before the council. And so uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's, you have no obligation to come before us. And so your willingness to do so, I, I really appreciate. Are there any other council comments at this time? Alyssa. I just want to follow up on one of the questions that was raised while the answers are being mm -hmm. obtained. It's been a long time since I was part of a project like this. And so um, I understand the question about the site visit. I also understand that the state designed the process to be for municipal government officials, not for the neighbors. And so I would like that decision not to simply be made by staff on their own. Mm -hmm. I think that's a discussion that if it's going to be opened beyond what is predicted by the state, that that's something we should have input on. That, I'm sorry, would you speak up on that so, last So what I'm trying to be clear about is no, not the neighbors. And if the decision is made to include the neighbors, if there is if there is staff feeling that that would be helpful to the process somehow, I think that discussion should come back here. I don't think that's a discussion, a decision that staff should make on their own because that's not the way the process is set up with the state. Okay. Are there any other comments from this, from the council at this time? Dorothy, just a very brief. I have a very brief question. Um, in the uh, apartments for the more vulnerable residents, I am hoping that you are including women, and that is one of the reasons why I have been very concerned about ask, asking about support services. I, I don't think it should just be all male. Um, okay. Any other comments? Pat. Um, I've never heard that the project was all male. I don't think also women need special protections. Um, and I'm also concerned uh, when we start talking about the differences between neighbors in different parts of Amherst. There's a lot of coding that goes on in conversations. And it would be helpful to me if I knew more about what people meant when they were saying some of the things that they were saying. And, and I think that's a time that we as a council need to ask for more direct um, reaction instead of coding. Okay. Any other comments from counselors? Okay, thank you very much, Valley CDC, for being here. Um, we actually completed public comment. Please come forward and then let's make sure we move on. Thank you. Again, the purpose of this was to provide an update on the timing. Right, no, I appreciate that. And this is a, a sort of a timing question. Okay. And as they have been through this, I think that they might be able to give me at least some guidelines. Uh, my name is Barbara Braben Wilbur and I'm 126 Northampton Road. And I P too appreciate- Please speak into the mic. Sorry. Um, and I too do appreciate, sorry for my back. Um, um, the time that they've taken and they have been communicative and we are reading, meeting with them later this week to clarify some of our issues and hear more from them. My question has to do with the zoning board and a sense of how long it takes from the time that you submit, you get a response that it would then go to the zoning board, the town zoning board. So that's my question. Just ballpark, I mean is it, you've got 30 days to respond does the zoning board um, meet within that time period, or does the zoning board say, okay, we can meet in two months, three months? Yes, please come forward, Laura. Um, so, 
So this is a highly regulated process on the zoning end. And so I will tell you my experience. Um, when we've submitted uh, this kind of application to the state before, it has taken them months to respond with a letter. And then we can, as soon as we get that letter, it's one of the thresholds for applying to the ZBA. As long as we feel ready and we have that letter and we have site control, which we do, we can apply. Uh, the zoning board has, I believe, 45 days to open the hearing. They have 180 days to conduct the hearing. They can have a hearing and if they don't feel finished, they can continue to another night. Once they close the hearing, they have some other specified 30 to 45 day period to issue their decision. So it can be, it, I've seen it go through in one night. I've spent six months in hearings. So it's think, a pretty big range. Um, let me just summarize. I think what we're hearing from everybody is the uh, need to have information readily available in a site that the town has, that CDC has, and that to the extent possible, we give people anticipated sense of timeline and process. Mm -hmm. Because I think without that, people do feel that they don't, that they, that they do not feel empowered to move forward with how they would like to express their opinions. Okay? Yep. Uh, we're going to move on in our agenda, and we want to thank you all. Thank you. So our next agenda item is to come back to, and I say that quite deliberately, uh, to Community Choice Aggregation, CCA. And um, Sam, you have returned. Um, you might want to come forward. I don't see our presenters here. It's, it's Stephanie and Sam and uh, Andra, and I don't know if they might be in Stephanie's office or... Um, We're going to do that. I think they, looking at the agenda, they thought it was going to be later, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And, re and remind me again. <laughs> Just a little pause here. Thank you. Um, I want to just be very clear. The council and the CCA had a pretty robust discussion about this on December 16th. I don't think we feel the need to go back and redo that discussion. Um, in addition to that, I don't know that I would, I'm certainly not going to say I think you have unanimous support or even full support of the council, but I don't sense that this is a highly controversial discussion. More importantly is that we pass a motion that we can all agree to. And so that's really the purpose tonight. And even though we will have public comment, I'm gonna ask even that people who are making public comment not feel that they need to convince us that um, we need to do this on behalf of our community. So, you have provided us with some additional information. Is there anything you would like to make sure you've pointed out about that additional information? If you want to start out. Um, I guess the only things that I, the only points I wanted to make were really to make clear some of the benefits 
of community choice aggregation, and I don't know if that's something you feel like you've heard and you don't feel you need to hear again. I, I'm happy to summarize their short points. I think we've pretty much got it. Okay. Anybody else need that? Okay. Moving along. Anything else? <laughs> I, you have to understand, nope. I get pressure from this group to keep the agenda moving. That's, that's why I asked. Okay? So. And do not take the attitude or the side comments as being non-supportive. They're just really supportive. So, okay. Is there, yes, Alyssa. If I could just ask, so there was a ton of information we didn't have on December 16th. We liked the idea of what you were saying, but right. we didn't have a lot of details. So if you would please just remind us and the public of what you've given us since then that answers the, that you don't have to tell us what the answers are. Just remind us what the materials right. are. Thank you. That you've provided. That's exactly it. Okay, so maybe we'll just give a very brief overview of the authorization, what it entails. It's basically, can you hear me okay? Just, yes. Just okay. The materials that were submitted. The additional, the additional supporting materials. Oh, the supporting materials. Okay, so there's an article about uh, joint powers agreements mm -hmm. that gives you an overview of what they are um, and the benefits that they provide. It's, and that's one form of agreement that the task force is considering that the municipality should enter into to jointly administer the aggregation program. Uh, the materials also include uh, Department of Public Utilities web page that outlines the process for uh, establishing a municipal aggregation program which includes submitting your aggregation plan to the DPU for its approval. Um, additional materials. I thought your memo was the memo, extremely you. useful. Right, thank you. And, okay. and we, we drafted a memo that tried to address uh, helpful questions that were raised by a number of you including Alyssa. Um, I think that's those, that covers the additional materials. Okay. Are there any questions from the council about the additional materials or the previous materials? All right. So then following our meeting in which we had a discussion about whether, first of all, was it was the Department of Public Utilities or Energy Resources and your memo clearly clarified that. And then there was the discussion as to whether or not we wanted two votes or one vote. And then there was a discussion about um, what else needed to be in the motion. And as president, I asked people to provide me individually with their thoughts. And I will tell you, I received no less than eight to 10 versions of the motion that we should have. So what we actually did was, after collecting all of those and trying to come up with a motion myself, uh, we then sent something off to our legal counsel and it is the legal counsel's motion that we are going to begin with tonight. So could we have that up on the screen since it came to us probably around 4.30 this afternoon? And if you could enlarge it so that people can read it and notice that um, there are some cross outs and there are some additional words in that. Is there anybody who would like me to read the motion? Kathy. Well, Lynn, I just have a, a question about this because this revised motion expands uh, the authority that the others were asking for. So I think people should know that there is a significant change in this before we just look at this. Because the, just, I got it at 4.30, but I tapped into the MGL and this originally just asked for joint powers agreement. Now it's referring to two sections of the MGL and you could either do this or you could do that. And they aren't the same. Um, so I just want to know whether that's fine. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's, it's a substantive change, yeah. so I just want to know, is that okay? Asking questions about this motion is absolutely where we're going, okay? Okay. I, I want to just make sure we all know that this is the motion we're going to start with tonight, okay? That none of the other motions that you've seen or have been sent or been lobbied about, this is the motion we're going to start with tonight, okay? And there are questions that I think you will raise about this motion. But to do that, let me start by asking if someone will put this in the form of a motion. Okay. 
Mandy Jo. So I'm just going to read it. Um, I knew I'd get somebody else to read it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to change it slightly to accommodate Al Alyssa over here. Um, moved um, to authorize the town manager to act jointly with other municipalities to initiate the process to aggregate the electrical load of interested electricity consumers under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 164, Section 134 for the primary purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions through energy efficiency and the development of local renewable distributed energy resources, provided that the town council shall be required to approve the municipal aggregation plan before it is filed with the Department of Public Utilities, DPU, and after it is developed in consultation with the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, DOER. Further, to authorize the town manager to negotiate an intergovernmental agreement or a joint powers agreement pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40, Section 4A, or Section 4A and a half, to develop and administer the municipal aggregation herein authorized and provide for additional energy-related products and services, provided that execution of said agreement shall be subject to authorization by the town council at a future meeting. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. Now, questions. Dorothy. I move Darcy. to amend. Darcy. Is this the time to do that? You want to make an amendment? Okay. Yes. I'd like to have give an opportunity for people to ask questions about things they feel appear here but did not appear in the previous motion and ask for clarification of that since that's been raised. Okay. Kathy. Okay, that's where I started. So what has been added, if um, people's eyes aren't blurry, is there's a section 4A that is now referenced. Um, there are two sets of new words, negotiate an intergovernmental agreement. Those words were not in there. So it says that or a joint powers agreement with sections 4A or 4A one and a half. 4A is the intergovernment part and for a and a half is the joint powers. So when I went and read them, they're different. You know, they're not necessarily one is better or worse, but they are different. So this has been added to the motion that we saw a month ago or three weeks ago and all the versions we've seen over the last week. So it, it's an addition. Um, and my understanding is that this ex expands the possibilities of what we're entering into, and I didn't know whether we wanted to do that or not. Let me just also mention that adding in intergovernmental agreement, which is in fact section 4A, was at the recommendation of our town attorney. And okay. I, I, asked, I asked Paul, and he said this leaves us more flexibility. I mean, it, it, okay. it's an alternative, so I just, since it was originally proposed more narrowly, you know, not necessarily narrowly, but JPA, now we've got two clauses, that's a change and I wanna understand, is that okay? I don't have an opinion about it. I don't know enough about it. I'm gonna take Darcy. I, I would just ask the task force representatives, do, would you think, would you say that's a friendly amendment? Yes. Yes. And yeah. Alyssa? It, it was always our intention that the municipalities would have the option to uh, form a cooperative agreement, like an intergovernmental agreement, which is a typical cooperative agreement. Okay. That was my question. You know, as long as it's either or is okay, mm -hmm. that it's two different routes to getting to, to aggregation. Okay. Alyssa. So following on that, because when, when this originally came to us, it was talking about a joint powers agreement and a joint powers entity. We don't have any of those. And a bunch of people just sat here like, okay. I'm like, I, you don't even know what that is. We don't yes. have it in the MGL. We don't have any that we're party to. We have a bunch of intermunicipal agreements, which are technically called um, the other thing that's 4A. Intergovernmental Intergovern agreement. We call them intermunicipals, but they're technically called yeah. intergovernmental agreements. We have a bunch of those. Like, that's how we do dog pounds and work with Hadley, and we do all those things. And so I was like, well, aren't we just trying to do that? And then as things were explained, no, actually there's a really special thing, the Joint Powers Agreement, and it's actually only been in existence for a couple of years. We don't have any right now. 
And I did not know that the attorney was going to say, well, go ahead and hedge your bets and put both of them in there. But it makes sense to me okay. that, that it expands to both of those because one we use all the time. The other mm -hmm. one's a new thing that seems to be especially applicable to this sort of situation. But it gives, it gives our authorization options. Let me just say, as the person who kept trying to find out what form of government this was or organization, I said, is it a nonprofit? Is it a quasi-public? Thank you for this clarification, and thank you for pointing out that we already have various intergovernmental agreements, and that's the form we're used to. Are there other questions about the motion in terms of clarifying what has been added, et cetera? Evan. Yeah, so, and I'm not sure if this is a question for the task force or the people who crafted this. But first of all, thank you for those, doc, that report was really useful and that article was also very useful and also very interesting because um, Alyssa is right. I had no idea what a JPA was. And so it's always, it's always good to know what I'm voting on. Um, I, I guess, so my reading of this motion is that there are two separate authorizations that council would have to do um, beyond the one that we're doing today which seems like one more authorization than we had talked about last time. My understanding when I walked out of the room last time was we were authorizing the town manager to move forward and maybe we had the option to then again approve the plan, which is in that first part. Um, now there's this additional authorization and I'm sort of curious, and I, again, I don't know who this is directed to of the sort of the, the genesis of that and, and what that means and how that compares to, we know that Pelham has an additional authorization, but to me this is beyond that. I, I need a little bit of clarity there. I, uh, please clarify if somebody can, but I read it as only two times, this time and one other. So yeah, I, they're separate. One is in a, like Evan's correct that there are two separate additional approval processes. One is framed or phrased as an approval of the aggregation plan after it's developed and before it's submitted uh -huh. to the DPU. Yeah. And the second is framed as a subsequent authorization by the town council of the joint powers agreement after it's drafted before it's executed. Okay. And Thank you. All right. So it does add an additional authorization of ours. Can I just have one more clarifying yeah. question? So then the municipal aggregation plan, would that still, when that's submitted, is it still in question whether we're going to do an intergovernmental intergovernmental agreement or the JPA, or is that part of the plan but also needs to be authorized as a separate entity? The short answer is no. Initially, the municipalities have to enter into an intergovernmental agreement or a joint powers agreement before submitting the aggregation plan, which gets submitted under that agreement. Now, if, for example, the municipalities enter into an intergovernmental agreement and submit an aggregation plan to the DPU in that manner, and that plan gets approved, the municipalities could subsequently reorganize the program under a joint powers agreement in the future. Would that have to go back to they would submit an amendment to the existing plan, to the DPU. And in either case, whether that JPA was entered into before the original aggregation plan was submitted to DPU or later on through an amendment to DPU, and under this language, your body would have to authorize the execution of that JPA. Okay. So this includes both the authorization of the JPA and the authorization of the plan prior to being, it being submitted. Okay? Darcy. Um, I just would like it if you would uh, speak to your memo, the part of your memo um, where you talked about the language that the, the task force basically wrote this language although it's been edited by the lawyer, um, and you talked about your preference around coming back for further authorizations in that memo. Yeah, I think the genesis for requiring further authorization of the JPA before it's executed would be for those council members who want an abundance of oversight in this process and really want to be in the weeds of it. Um, it, that's not a legal requirement. And I would say that one consideration for omitting that requirement that you authorize the JPA before its execution would be when Amherst is partnering with other communities in Northampton in particular, 
investing resources and negotiating to reach consensus. You want the town manager to um, have the appearance of authority when he's making decisions in that process so that there's certainty that allows that process to go forward more smoothly versus participating in communities, being aware that whatever agreement is reached is going to require subsequent approval by this council and therefore create some risk, additional risk in the process. Kathy. So um, you said that very calmly, but it sounds like you would delete um, one step of this authorization process to make sure that we can speed up the agreements with other towns, that they don't feel like it's going to be overturned, I mean, that he has the authority to negotiate, um, and the, we would still be looking at the final plan before it's, implement, before it's executed. So, so just explain which of the two authorizations um, has the risk of slowing it down or having towns think that, we don't, that you're not able to negotiate with, with authority? Yeah, I would say I would personally recommend that you delete the requirement the town council authorize the JPA before its execution. And then I would also add something regarding the require the town council approve the aggregation plan. The statute requires citizen approval of the plan before its submission to DPU. That's under the law. So regardless of whether you have language in your authorization requiring further town council approval of the aggregation plan, Amherst is going to have to schedule a public meeting and present the aggregation plan and allow for public comment, typically for several weeks. That meeting, that public meeting can be standalone for the purpose of presenting the plan or it can be in conjunction with other activities. It could be during a town council meeting, for example. And so you are going to have a form of public review and oversight regardless of whether you have that additional approval. So I put that forward for your consideration. Alyssa. So there's a difference between, or, or there's not, and I'm misunderstanding it, so please fix me if I'm not. Um, there's a difference between saying it has to be in front of the public, and in fact, at one point, I tried to work that into the language, and that didn't need to be in there because it's in the MGL. But holding the hearing doesn't change anything about whether or not this council agrees that this is the plan that's supposed to go. So that's actually two very different things. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, I think so we're just clear that they yeah, are very I mean, different things. If you want it, people who want it to come back to the council can't depend on the MGL because the MGL only says you will give it a public airing and you will make sure that people have the opportunity to speak. That right. doesn't mean that the town manager can't just say thank you very much and go ahead and send it in. So the question is, do we want to have to ask him to come back to us saying, given what you heard, are you still sending it in? Or are we authorizing him to just follow the law and listen to people and then send it in? I mean, how much control do we want to exert is the question. Right. Yeah, I would just add that the town manager can still make changes to the plan after listening to public comment. And that's probably a recommended course depending on the nature of the comments. So it's not that you just listen to the comments and then send in the plan. But I agree that there's the distinction that you made is accurate. Seems like this Darcy. is a good, good time to be talking about making an amendment. So you'd like to make a motion to amend? Yes. Um, and the motion is, Athena has it. Um, so um, the motion, and I am going to talk more about it after I make the motion, but um, I'm, the motion uh, is more um, comprehensible if you look at the second uh, example under the motion because the first just uh, tells, do I need to read that first one? <laughs> um, I move to amend the motion to one, delete the phrase provided that the town council shall be required to approve the municipal aggregation plan before it's filed with the Department of Public Utilities and after it's developed in consultation with the Department of Energy Resources in the first sentence and replace it with the phrase, 
starting with developing a municipal aggregation plan to be filed with the Department of Public Utilities after it's developed in consultation with the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. Two, delete the word negotiate in the second sentence and replace it with the word execute. And three, delete the phrase provided that the ex that execution of said agreement shall be subject to authorization by the town council at a future meeting. Yeah, so you can see um, the act what it would actually look like below. Um, with basically what we're doing is um, after authorization, if we authorized the CCA today, it would delegate the authority to the town manager to do the next two sign-offs. Um, so I just have a little statement here that I'm going to read. Um, Having worked with Western Mass Community Choice Energy and the Intermunicipal CCA Task Force for the last two years, I am really excited um, with Amherst Hope for Authorization um, that with the authorization we can move forward with CCA for the region. I'd like to thank the members of the task force for all of their work and commitment to the project. Our authorization will help the town get a jump start at meeting its new energy and climate action goals. And in the long run, it's my hope that we can be part of a very innovative and effective CCA entity that will be a model for others around the U.S. in greenhouse gas reduction. I know that during our discussion on December 16th, Mandy Joe especially brought up the possibility of further authorizations by the town council, and the task force motion was amended to reflect those concerns. However, You've now heard the staff and task force representatives express that their preference is to actually allow the town manager to provide the further sign-offs to the CCA plan and to the JPA. Um, I'll be, I moved to, uh, to amend it already. Uh, my motion basically takes us back to the original motion that the task force brought last on December 16th um, that authorizes the town manager to the, t the town manager uh, to initiate the CCA and to execute the JPA and allows him to sign off on them. We didn't get into all the reasons why this is preferred on December 16th, but we've heard some more about it today. Um, and from my perspective, the main problem is, um, as Sam mentioned, um, that we're dealing here with three towns. We're counting on each other to act nimbly and with confidence and consideration for the other towns and not hesitation so that we can move forward. It's a tricky, complicated, and delicate dance that we're doing, especially to get started. And each of us is watching the others to see how we're acting. Our model is Northampton. Its council authorized the CCA and JPA development uh, which the executive can sign off on. We in Amherst don't have to worry about whether if we put our money into hiring a consultant that Northampton City Council will hold us up at some later date. And that is something that's coming up very soon, the town's authorizing funding to fund a consultant. And um, we really want the towns to feel confident that um, we're all moving forward with confidence. Um, Northampton has actually um, suggested that it could possibly act on its own, um, and that is something that we would like not to have happen if it saw that we were um, dragging our heels or that they had to worry about our, our authorization in what we would do in six months they might jump the gun and, and authorize on their own, in which case we wouldn't get that initial cachet of being a founding member of the, the <coughs> CCA, um, nor would we be in on necessarily helping to create the founding principles. So we would really like to avoid that happening. Um, I understand we're taking very seriously our responsibility of due diligence. 
um, who is capable of understanding insure, and ensuring that we're in safe territory when authorizing a CCA? My answer to that is staff, uh, and by extension, the town manager. Stephanie has been deeply in, in the weeds of CCA for more than two years now. She understands the many concepts involved. If you looked at the whole list of concepts in the task force report, um, Stephanie actually understands what they all mean. Um, she's hosted and facilitated many of the meetings. She's closely worked with other towns with UMass Clean Energy Extension, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on this topic. She's arranged and participated in meetings with DOER and Cape Lake Compact. Um, and she was very involved in writing the task force report that was presented. So, and I absolutely trust her understanding of CCA. And in addition to Stephanie, we have four members of the ECAC that are on the task force, two of whom work for UMass Clean Energy Extension. Um, and since we don't have experts on the town council regarding this matter, it does make sense in this situation to delegate further sign-offs to the executive. Um, in addition, if there's a legal question, Paul has access to KP Law for a legal opinion, for example, about the JPA if it's, if it's needed. Um, and it's also important to note, as Stan said last week, there is no financial risk involved to the town or to the residents in authorizing or in delegating the further authorizations to the town manager. Um, the main risk that we have that he said last week is that, that <coughs> the towns won't be able to have confidence and work with each other. So I hope you will consider voting to amend the motion so that it is in line with Northampton's um, and will give the town's confidence that Amherst is fully on board. Okay. There's original motion on the floor, but there's also now an amendment that's been made and seconded. The amendment as it would affect this motion is as appears under example, additions in red. If you could enlarge that, please. Don't know if you can. Yep, and move it to the center. Okay. Are there questions about this? Yes, Mandy Jo. I have a comment, but I don't really have a question. And then I have a request um, based on prior comments. So um, as Darcy indicated at the last meeting, I was one of the people pushing for additional votes that the council needed to potentially protect itself or the town by requiring the plan to come back to the council for a vote prior to DPU submission and all. Um, after thinking about it for a couple weeks, the benefit of having that time to think about it, I no longer support that. I support this motion. Um, I've thought long and hard about what our role as a legislative body is and as a policymaking body is and what the executive's role is. And I firmly believe that our role as a policymaking body is to set the policy not to micromanage the execution of that policy and that we need to trust our town manager to actually execute the policy. And if we support this amendment, that is what we're doing. We're delegating and trusting the manager that we've hired to actually implement CCA um, according to the authorization we've given without us needing to come back and say yes or no on that plan or come back and say, now that we've seen the JPA, no. Or now that we've seen it, yes. We would be saying, yes, you can execute a JPA, or yes, you can execute an intermunicipal agreement today. We would say today that he has the authority to execute that when it is negotiated. And I think we need to trust our manager, the person we've hired to manage the towns of Amherst, town of Amherst's affairs, to negotiate and execute the best agreements that he can under these things. Um, I don't know where the rest of the counselors stand on that, and I would hate to see this motion fail because they want one additional vote, but not two, so I'm actually going to request the president that we divide out sub-item one from this amendment and sub-item two and three as separate votes, sub-item one versus refers solely to deleting the future authorization required on the 
uh, municipal aggregation plan. Items two and three relate to deleting the future authorization on the JPA or in municipal agreement. Um, voting for sub items two and three in the amendment related to two and three would say today the town would say as of tonight's vote that the town manager has the authority to execute that agreement, not just negotiate it. Voting for sub item one would say we do not as a town council need to see the municipal aggregation plan before, before it is filed with the DPU. And I think it m potentially makes sense to have those votes separately on this council. So there's a motion on the floor. The motion has an amendment and now it has been asked that that amended, amendment be divided into two separate amendments. Is there a second? I think that just happens. Hmm? I, think just, I think dividing just happens at the request for division if it's logical to divide. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask if there's other general comments. Yes, Alyssa. So I'm fine with people arguing about whether they want to look at the plan again or not. I understand the philosophy behind that. I understand that your thinking's changed on that. I'm not particularly wedded to it one way or another. I'm fine with that. I am utterly 100,000% opposed to pre-authorizing a joint powers agreement. I cannot even fathom why we would give away a response. It's not just policy making or executive. The law says we authorize joint powers agreements and intermunicipal, what do we call, intergovernmental agreements. It does not say go off and set up a strategic partnership agreement with UMass. Do whatever you want. We're supposed to sign off on that. Same with bike share, same with sharing dog services and weights and measures. Do we want to learn all about weights and measures and get all the details? No, we trust the staff on that. But to pre-authorize, to just say, go off and, ex I, that is part of our job. MGL says it's part of our job. And so the idea that I would give that away by pre-authorizing just makes zero sense to me. I absolutely would not encourage us to say, oh, well, let's question it now. We are absolutely depending on the detailed expertise of all the people. At the same time, that's why we have to sign off on things like whether or not we share a dog pound. It's not because we all know about dog pounds. It's because it's our job to be responsible for understanding that that was come to by an appropriate means. It doesn't have to be a two hour conversation. It can be really fast. Other comments? Uh, Evan. Yeah, so this is an interesting discussion because it, it's really not about this, right? It's about how much legislative oversight we have over the town manager. Uh, all of this seems like an executive function, and so it seems as though it should be within the realm of the town manager. Uh, where I do have some hesitation on that part is, uh, you know, we have three different municipalities who have three different forms of government. And so saying, well, Northampton doesn't require it I don't, I don't buy that um, because in Northampton, it's being negotiated by a mayor who is accountable to the voters. And so this is something that's going to impact all of our residential electricity rate payers, um, who they're going to see us authorize something that has no form, nothing right now, and go off. And then maybe and then their counselors have nothing to say about that. Whereas in Northampton, if people all of a sudden see their electric bills go up and they don't like that because, and, and they fairly or unfairly think it's because of CCA, the, the executive in Northampton's accountable for that. And so I, I don't buy the Northampton thing at all because it's very different. This is a hired town manager as an executive. Um, just like I don't buy Pelham doing it as reason that we should do it. We're, we're a different beast than either of those two organizations. And so where I'm struggling is I want to empower our executive to do his executive responsibilities without us stepping on his toes. And I mean that in this situation and I mean that in many situations. It's, it's always interesting uh, to see how counselors fall on when they want legislative oversight and when they don't. And it seems to happen to do with what their priorities and their pet projects are. Um, so I want to empower the town manager, but I also want to make sure um, that the community feels though uh, there, that there are people out there who are looking out for them who are accountable to them. And so 
I don't really know how I'm going to vote on this yet, which is very rare for me. Um, and so I, I would like to have more discussion to hear from people because I think that there's a delicate balance at play here. So the motion that has now been divided, the two divisions, one is around approving either the intergovernmental or the JPA. The second is around improving the plan, correct? Just want to put it in plain English. All right. Additional questions or comments? Dorothy? Well, we do have accountability in that we are run for election. And our term is two more years before the next election. And I don't think this thing is going to, we'd have a chance to see how it's doing too much before then. If it turns out that the public doesn't like what it is, they'll let us know. And we'll have to give our uh, positions on it. So. Um, the town manager is hired by us. We are accountable to the public. So there is democratic input. Additional comments? Mandy Jo. So I just wanted to respond to something Evan said about um, rates going up. Neither of these requirements, if we keep either requirement in for a future vote, will at neither time will the council know what the rates on electricity are, and we won't that that will be months out from that. So, so if the desire is to hold off until rates are known, that you know, you know that 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 this won't help. Um, so, I, I just wanted to make that clear in case there were counselors that were unclear on that, or in case there were public that were unclear about both of these. If we keep those votes in, are well before any future rates under CCA are even determined. Andy. Yeah, following up on what uh, Mandy just said, um, Stephanie at the very beginning had offered to uh, make a description of what are the key points that we would achieve by going through this entire enterprise. And I'm not suggesting that we go back and um, I'm not ask the president to revisit the decision, but um, that kind of presentation, I think, um, would have helped assure that we understood, but more as important as assuring that we understood, it would have encapsulated how we make that explanation to our constituents and how constituents understand that this program works, which I think is vital because I think that there, may, there must be public confidence. I have confidence in it. Um, I will appreciate any assistance I get in how to convey that confidence to uh, residents that I talk to. So if we don't want to have that conversation today, which is fine because it is a little bit different from the agreement, I do think that we need to find a way to allow Stephanie to get that presentation to us mm -hmm. in another format. Okay. Are there additional comments from counselors on this, on both of these pieces? that have now been brought forward in the amendment and that we are now splitting to vote on. <coughs> Darcy. I was just going to ask um, Sam if he could respond to um, Alyssa's comment about that further authorizations are required in those two areas. Yeah, our reading of the JPA statute is that the authorization in the, the initial authorization where you authorize the town manager to enter into and execute a joint powers agreement is the sole authorization required under the statute. There is no subsequent authorization required. Therefore, that's not a pre-authorization. It's the only authorization. That's, that's how Northampton has authorized their uh, mayor to enter into a JPA. That's how we interpret the statute. If that's an incorrect interpretation and we remove that subsequent language, then it's legally ineffective. So I, it's not, by, to the extent that it's legally effective, it's not, a, it's not a question of what the legal requirement is. It's just a question of whether you want to have that additional oversight. You as a town council. Alyssa. So again, we don't have any JPAs. I read the articles. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. And so I'm perfectly willing to accept that that's the explanation for JPAs, again, with an elected executive having that authority to do that. But 
if the intermunicipal agreement, intergovernmental agreement stays in here, that absolutely is not how that's interpreted legally. That you can't interpret, I mean, I, I'm not saying you did. I'm saying one cannot interpret MGL associated with intermunicipal agreement the way the MGL is written for intermunicipal agreements to say, it says, go off and make one. That's not what the MGL says. The MGL says you're authorizing it. So if you're tracking the language between the two of those, then that's perhaps problematic. But I'm totally willing to accept that the JPA language is separate. But intermunicipal agreements clearly are not, you authorize the town manager to go off and make a, an, an agreement on weights and measures, and he just goes and does it. That's not how it works for, for intergovernmental agreements. So it may be different for JPAs, and that's fine. And that could be that that's the authorization point. But as long as intergovernmental is still in here, I'm not going to give away that ability. Okay. Are there additional questions or comments? Yes, Imidio. Yeah. So I think the question is of the timing. Both statutes require the council to authorize the manager to execute. Normally, when we've done this in the past with Dark Dog Park, I think for intermunicipal, the council's already authorized the manager to execute a couple of intermunicipal agreements, intergovernmental agreements during our course of this year. He's already negotiated them when he comes to us asking for the authorization to execute them. Um, so they're already negotiated. This is saying before it's negotiated, you have the authority to execute it. So it's just a matter of when the council is giving the authorization to execute before it's negotiated or after it's negotiated. And the amendment would mean we're giving the authorization for the town manager to execute those agreements prior to his actually negotiating them. Whereas if we keep the original language that was in the main motion, we would not, we would not be authorizing the execution until after it is negotiated. We now have two motions. Paul, did you need to speak to this? You came, I, you I looked like you wanted to. <laughs> would you like to wade in? <laughs> So I, th I think the way this is set up is that the executive is authorized to sign contracts on behalf of the town. Right. That's what's in our charter. What this request is, is does the, does the town council want the town manager to enter into a contract with another city or town? Right. And that's the qu question before the council. It's not to say we have the authority to negotiate that contract. What's the town manager's role in that case? So I think that it's the division between the authority to execute, not just execute, but negotiate and execute a contract, which is an executive function, versus the authority to say, I want to expand our footprint beyond our community. So right now, the town manager have, has the ability to enter into contracts for the town. Only the town manager has that ability. The town council does not. So that's in our charter. That's what the law says. So I think this sort of mirrors that. And that's the question for the council. I mean. I'm open to whatever um, uh, the council is interested in. I know this is a big step for the town, so I think the council should be recognize what we're getting into and be accountable for that, as should the town manager. But to observe the fidelity of the charter, I think you would say our authority is to say, yes, you can go do it. And then the town manager's authority, whether it's a mayor or a manager, is irrelevant. It's the executive function that we're talking about that that's the authority that, that's already in the charter. Alyssa. I'm really confused because are you saying that under the charter that we have now versus the town government act we had before that your power is increased when it comes to intergovernmental contracts in comparison to what it was under the old form of government because the MGL remains the same. And so I, I'm confused by that. But if you're looking at the intergovernmental agreements, it's, it, it's, it's the legislative body didn't get into negotiating the details of right. the of the agreement. The select board did. The select board was part of the executive at that point in time. Right. No, we didn't. We didn't ever get into. The details. You could Sorry, have. We weren't here. Yeah. Um, we didn't ever get into the details of negotiating the various things like that. What we did was we authorized you to execute that agreement. That's still true under the MGL until someone explains to me that it's not, and so. We still, I mean, we could 
just like with this, just pre-authorize you to go off and make all the agreements you want in the world. But that has not been our approach, and that has not been KP Law's interpretation under our former form of government that you could, that the previous town manager could just go and do that. The original strategic partnership agreement was done without complying with the intergovernmental agreement. That was clear. Um, it happened, it was over, it's way before his time. What I'm trying to understand is, I think I understand what we're talking about here. I just want to make sure we're not, if we want to pick and choose which things we want to pre-authorize, I'm okay with that in theory. What I'm not okay with if it, is if I'm hearing suddenly actually that our charter changes our re relationship to intergovernmental agreements because that's not something we've ever talked about up until this point. I am looking at you. Uh, okay. I, I mean, I'm not sure I can answer that. The, the charter gives the manager the Absolutely. authority to sign contracts, but the town government act. But the MGL for these sections states the town council authorizes the town manager to execute. And it, I think it's a question of timing as to when we want to authorize that execution before it's negotiated or after it's negotiated. It was not a question in KP Law's mind under the former Town Government Act, under which the town manager also was the only one who could execute contracts. The select board could not execute contracts. Okay, the question before us, and I, I want to leave here tonight, and I also don't, we cannot spend a whole lot more time on this. I want to leave here tonight with allowing this to go forward in some manner. If that means we need to split this motion and only act on one piece of it, fine. If we need to continue to uh, or act on both of the split pieces of it, the way I understand it, one is that we want the town manager to bring back the JPA once he has negotiated it and we authorize him to ex execute it. Am I correct? That's section two and three and voting yes on the amendment would mean the manager does not bring it back that he's already, as Alyssa would say, pre-authorized to execute. Voting no on the amendment regarding two and three would say the manager needs to bring back an negotiated agreement and ask for our authorization to execute it at that time. Okay. Is there questions on that part of this motion? Can we call the question? I'm going to. So I'm going to call the question. Again, A means? Uh, Voting on the JPA language? Yes. Okay. So. Yes means you don't you want this vote tonight to be the final time to to be the authorization for the manager to execute a joint powers agreement or an intergovernmental agreement. No means you want a negotiated agreement to come back to the council for authorization for the manager to execute. Okay. All those in yes. Just for quick. So you divided the question, right? Yes, we did. And she took two and three first. Okay, you're doing, okay. That was a, that was a confusing That's word. what I'm still confused about, is okay. which one are we, now which one are we doing first? Subsections two and three of the motion but she there's wanted. There's no twos and threes here. Yeah, there are. Oh, so, okay. Of the so motion. Way at the top. Way at the top. Section, subsection two and subsection three is what Lynn wanted to vote on first. It's the second half of it. Could someone put what we used to do? Could someone put an actual motion that we're attempting to act on up there on the screen? So the so the motion yeah. is to amend the main motion to delete the word negotiate in the second sentence and replace with the word execute and delete the phrase comma provided that execution of said agreement shall be subject to authorization by the town council at a future meeting. That's what Lynn asked for us to vote and on first. If you just go slightly more, no, the other way, then you see how it's amended in the second. The second sentence of the original motion. So it starts with to negotiate where we say delete that and put in execute.
further the Amherst Town Council. So further the Amherst Town Council authorizes the town manager to execute an intergovernmental agreement or a joint powers agreement pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 40, Section A, 4A or Section 4A and a half to develop and administer the municipal agreement, uh, aggregation herein authorized, and provide for additional energy-related products and services, period. That is so what, the, yeah. that is the second part. What Athena has highlighted on is what Lynn has asked us to vote on first. If right. you like the changes in the highlighted portion there, vote yes. If, if you, you don't, vote no. <laughs> Okay, call the question. All those in favor, which equals yes, raise your hand and say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Abstain. Did you get that all? Okay. Okay. So, opposed? Please opposed. <laughs> and abstain. Did that you get the That was eight in favor, three opposed, and one abstention. That's correct. Okay. We're moving on to the first part of it. And the first part of it is highlighted. Uh, where do you want me to start? go all the way back up to authorize the town manager. Basically, that is the first part of it. And this is the part that deals with the plan and whether or not we feel the plan needs to come back to us. Okay? Questions. If you vote yes, this means the plan does not need to come back to us. If you vote no, this means the plan has to come back to us. And if you abstain, you are perfectly every right to do that. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> all of those in favor of this part of the motion, please raise your hand and say aye, which means yes. Aye. aye. Opposed? Raise your hand and say no. Abstain. I just wasn't fast enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm would, really, I know that that's stupid because we just talked about exactly what we were doing. Except that I was just. I need a little more. Okay. Like, that's okay. This come, and this is going to come here. And then we're going to switch it in. Okay. Oh, that's okay. Not a problem. I, I'd like to have a little Venn diagram. Um, okay, all those in favor mean yes, you agree with deleting and adding these phrases, and it means yes, you agree you will not see the plan. Again. Again, okay. Opposed means you want to see it again, okay? All those in favor and yes, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. That's 12-0-0, okay? So now we are back to the original motion. And the original motion is as what? you see it, the original as amended, amended, as amended, is as you see it up here. Because we ha now have accepted all of the crossouts and all of the additions, okay? Is there any question? Okay, call the question. All those in favor of the amended motion, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. 12 zero, 0 Thank you. Thank we you. did observe, we did reserve for public comment. Is there anybody who feels they need to make public comment at this point on this issue? On this issue only? We'll have a general public comment in a moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Okay.